Yes. Okay. In just about a minute or so, I'm going to start with some basic instructions about how Zoom webinars work, and then I'll hand it off to Holly, who will get us started with the presentation itself. And she'll be introducing our guest speakers. We have an exciting presentation lined up for you today. So I guess I'll get started on the logistics now. Some of you may not be familiar with Zoom. In order to have the best experience, if you go to the upper right corner where it says view, there will be a drop down that will allow you to select gallery mode. That way you'll be able to see those people who have their videos on more clearly. And it should just be the presenters. We're going to ask that you hold your questions until the end of the presentation. You can go ahead and actually enter them in the chat. I'll be the one monitoring that and keeping, a, keeping track of who has questions and in what order, but we're not going to actually present the questions to the speakers until the end of the presentation. But feel free to enter them in the chat at any time as we go through. If you have any concerns or questions, please direct them to me or to Holly. That's to Travis or to Holly. I think that's covered the basics here. Holly says, what about the captions? Travis speaking, yes, at the bottom of the screen, you have a row of icons, one of which is live transcript. Click on that and you'll get an option to turn on the captions. I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Travis Dougherty. I I'm the manager of Maryland Relay. And I've been a supporter of NASRA for quite a while, and I hope that we can have more webinars like this to further our work. Holly? Holly speaking. Thank you, Travis. I'm Holly Bice. I'm currently the chair of NASRA. We're very excited to bring this event to you today. NASRA's focus has been primarily on TRS and caption telephone service, and we haven't done a good job on reaching out to other communities. We've, we've got strong representation and involvement with the deaf community, but not the deaf blind community. With this webinar, we want to encourage state programs to be more actively engaged with their local deafblind community. To make the effort to learn what the community needs in your area. To learn about what equipment would be of use to them and what they think would be the best fit for them in their, in their local community. And one part of our work in that direction is this webinar today. I'd like to introduce our two presenters today. First, we have Brian Yunashko and Tor Nielsen. Brian works with a company called Access 256. They provide equipment for people who are deafblind. Tor, who lives in Sweden, works for a company by the name of NYSE. So let me turn it over to Brian and Tor to share with us the information you have about technology that can serve deafblind people in the deafblind community. Take it away. Brian speaking. Hello, everyone. I hope that those who are following my signs can see me clearly. If you can give me some reaction, that would be great. And Travis popping up saying, yep, we see you fine. Brian speaking. Yes, my name is Brian Yunashko. I'm coming to you from Chicago, Illinois. Anybody else here from Illinois? No? Hope we got some fellow Chicagoans out there. My company is Access 256. And to, um, with our, for our products, we partner with NYSE, who, which is the company that Tor is representing today. We distribute the software that we'll be talking about today. I'm also a trainer. 
I work with deafblind consumers as well as a national deafblind equipment distribution program, also known as ICC. I can connect the acronym is ICC. I work in the variety of states providing direct training to consumers so they can learn about alter, um, adaptive technology that might serve their needs best. And through this experience, I've gained a wealth of knowledge about what it is that we need, what will work for us. And through partnering with NWISE, I've learned about the excellent software that they've developed and they've worked with us to put the finishing touches on it to make sure that that software is truly useful to people who are deafblind and ready to meet our needs. We'll be giving you some examples later on of how that software works and how it can be a very effective program for deafblind people. I don't support this product just because I sell it, but because I am also an avid user of it myself. This software has given me a, a lot of freedom. And when I agreed to partner with NYS, I only knew a little bit about it, but through my working with them, I've seen just how versatile it is and just how much more it can do than even I realized in order to provide um, access for deafblind people. Several state agencies have been asking me to consult with them about how they can select the appropriate equipment to provide to their, cons their constituents under their TED programs. And I'm available to support you, to help you work through any questions you might have. I also understand that you have a big interest in RTT, which is real-time text. Tor is the expert on that. He knows all there is to know about RTT and that's how it's being implemented globally. His company provides a relay platform for a number of countries around the world. And RTT is at the heart of everything we do. <clears throat> So anytime you have questions about how you might implement RTT in your school, please reach out to Tor. So before we go on with the formal presentation, I did want to briefly touch on one concept that, uh, and this has to do with RTT. I know that most of you have had an experience with that using your phone with the native RTT functionality in the phone. That's a commonly used term native to refer to any app that comes with the phone, native RTT in this case. But that also has problems. Some of you may have experienced challenges using the native RTT. Our service does not use the native RTT. We use what we call an over-the-top RTT or o OTT, RTT, <laughs> over-the-top real-time text. And this rides on the signal that connects to the internet through the, the, that the phone uses to connect to the internet. And we found that to be a much more effective process Hopefully this will help you overcome whatever resistance you've built up to RTT based on the native RTT, because this works in a very different way. That's not the RTT that we use. We use the better RTT. Tor, would you like to add anything before we get started? Yes. Thank you, Brian, for the great introduction and uh, really covering 
just about everything. <laughs> um, I just wanted to, to um, introduce just our company a little bit very shortly. As Brian said, we've been working with RTT um, for a long time now. And we are technology providers. We provide technology for uh, uh, relay services and for emergency services here in Europe, they're called 112. Uh, in the US, we provide technology for one VRS provider. We provide, uh, we, uh, together with Brian, we work with a special uh, video application for uh, deafblind consumers. And uh, we are also involved in a, a couple of accessive uh, uh, committees at NINA. So uh, working through and, and, and um, understanding and talking about uh, RTT 2911. Um, here in Europe, we're using uh, OTT, over the top RTT, mostly. Um, and uh, so that's why we, we, we choose this path. Uh, it's a comment to native RTT, as Brian was saying. Um, the importance of uh, over the top RTT is that it can, uh, since it's an app, it can be especially adapted to smaller needs of the community. So our goal here has been to um, comply with the needs of the deafblind community, both uh, low vision and braille, because we realized and we can see that the uh, native RTT in the um, smartphones is not really accessible for deafblind. Back to you, Brian. Okay. Well, now on with the show. We're going to start with a brief video, which will give you an idea of how MMX works. Let me hand that over to Tor and you can share your screen to show the video. Perfect, so I will share the screen. Um, um, this is a question to Travis. Uh, this time when I'm sharing the screen share, it shows a few options here. One participant sharing at a time, but maybe I'm not able to share. <laughs> I did it just before, so typical, just before. Um, let me try to see if I, yeah, now I'm able to share, sorry. Thank you about that. Um, let me get the right uh, option here. I think everyone has a splash screen. Uh, you can see everything, so I uh, will start and play the film. It's about four minutes, so I may uh, uh, just make it a bit faster at some point. So we start with a call being received by a deaf bank consumer. Sorry, making a call. So you can see, type the number. Um, and uh, Brian, in this case, is making a call to a friend uh, using, that is using the Antouch provided by Sorenson. And this is something which is interesting about uh, over the top RTT. The VRS providers, three out of four, are currently providing uh, RTT in their apps. So it's possible to make a text call and video call. In this case, Brian is signing to Stacy. And uh, Stacy, uh, instead of signing back to Brian, she will be typing instead. And Brian can read the text. You see in the screen that this is Brian's screen that we're seeing now. So the video screen uh, is much smaller and the text screen is larger. Text is connected to Braille, as you can see. 
the size of the text can be adjusted for low vision as well. And Brian can navigate in the uh, app uh, with, uh, with the Brave keyboard. What I do, I move fast forward a little bit. So I'm gonna call is finished. Then uh, Brian hangs up and uh, that's it. This is how it shows in the, uh, um, in the iPad on the screen. So Brian is going, instead of, uh, it's like everybody does in the iPhone, I think we just look at the last number we have called. And it's, it's, that's the difference between the native RTT and uh, over the top with my MMX. Brian can uh, navigate easily in the, uh, uh, in the keyboard. And now he's che checking a um, conversation that he has saved. So you can always save the conversation. You can forward when you save and then um, decide what you want to do with it. Okay, Brian, I close the desktop sharing. Back to you. Great. Okay. So that's our brief demo of what that video call looks like. I couldn't demo a live call during this presentation because our technology and Zoom aren't, don't get along very well. So, but you got an idea from the video. So that gives the deafblind person 100% freedom to call anyone. I don't have to wait for someone to come over to my home to do uh, tactile signing for me. I have all the technology I need to place and receive calls on my own. What you just saw was an example of a point to point call. That means I just called directly to, in this case, it was my assistant. I reached her video phone, which was a Sorensen video phone. And then my MMX DB was the app that I was using. And it's compatible with all of the video phones that support RTT. It gives me a lot of freedom. When I was first contacted to discuss this product, I was thinking, okay, well then I'm going to need to connect to the relay service. How's that gonna happen? Because I also, I mean, that's all well and good, but I need to be able to communicate directly point to point with friends that I used to be able to, to sign with directly, but I haven't been able to since I've lost my vision. But with my MMX, I'm able to reconnect with all of my old friends. I'm able to reestablish my old support system. It, it really removes all those old limitations and I can communicate with people freely. It's just really awesome. I can make three different types of calls. One would be through a relay. And that the, the relay agent would type back to me. I can do a point to point between me and someone else who uses the video phone. Like what, that's what you saw in the video. Another would be direct communication with another deaf-blind person. 
In that case, we would both be using my MMX DB. We would both be typing back and forth to one another, basically like how the old TTYs worked. Maybe you noticed in that video, we still use the old turn-taking conventions of GA and SK. You thought those went away, didn't you? <laughs> nope, they, they live on with us. There's really pr no call that we can't make anymore. I also want to emphasize, this is not the only modality for us to use. Sighted people have options, so do we, in terms of how you want to communicate with people. Maybe you want to call your doctor in the morning, but then you want to send an email to your coworker in the afternoon. Maybe in the evening, you're texting with a family member. You move um, amongst all of those seamlessly. The same is true with us. MMX is not meant to replace the other forms of communication that deafblind people use. It's meant to augment it and to provide more options. I know that programs have typically provided a single option for deafblind people, and we, but, the, but you realize that's not the, the best way to serve the community. We want to provide the full range of options that deaf pe deafblind people can select is what's best for them in the moment. Many of you have talked about establishing communication facilitator programs in your states, and I'm in favor of that. I like using that sometimes too. Sometimes that's just easier to use tactile signing through a communication facilitator than through the refreshable braille device. But that has its downsides as well because then you have to make an appointment to have the CF or communication facil facilitator come to your location. They may not be available or you may not have the time to arrange that before you make this call that you need to make. So I use that when that's um, what's easiest for me, but then other times I will make it through my MMX because for that, I can access that instantly. In our next release, we are going to add what we call CF or communication facil facilitator mode. And when you select that, uh, you'll, it'll act, it'll function most li more like a traditional video phone because you'll have the CF sitting there with you. It provides more flexibility. One challenge now is that people have too many phone numbers. I have my regular video phone phone number when I have a CF working with me, but a different one for my MMX. And I have to keep straight in my head which number I've given out to whom, and it can be a little confusing. I mean, deaf people know you've got a whole host of phone numbers that you use to access different relay services. We think that adding this functionality to my MMX DB will help reduce that problem. Hopefully we'll have that available in, in coming months so that when I don't have the CF with me, I can use my MMX to receive and make calls to check my messages with its current functionality, but then I'll be able to use it with a CF once that functionality is enabled. This software is designed for Braille users with a connection to the refreshable Braille display. display. That's, here's what that looks like. Here's another one attached to a keyboard. There are a variety of refreshable Braille displays out there. And this can work with all of them. Well, as long as that display is compatible with the operating system. MMX can work with both, or we offer it in, on iOS devices, iPhones and iPads, as well as Windows devices.
hopefully in the fall, we'll be able to have it available for the Mac OS as well. But only for Macs that have uh, M chips installed. We will not be able to support older Macs, only the newer ones that have the M chip. We also provide access for people who have low vision. We have options that can give very, very high contrast or very large fonts. For people who still have some vision, let's say can't see a video clearly, but they can read text. We provide options in font size and other, uh, other settings such as font size, color, and that can be on both sides of the conversation. We're going to switch interpreters now. So if I am typing with somebody, my font can be blue with a pink background if I choose. And you, when you type, can you can have red font with a black background. So it's easier for me to differentiate which lines are my portions of the conversation and which are yours. So my MMX does support that differentiation. Tor, do you mind sharing the front screen of the app? This is Tor here. So I'll do a screen share in just a second. Okay, everybody should be able to see my screen. You may want to pin Brian. Brian will be navigating through the uh, iPad and they'll be uh, pressing the different commanders on the iPad. Go ahead, Brian. So on this screen, you can see the six icons. Is that correct? Is that what you're seeing now? That's correct. Okay. This is called the front page. And this is one example of how we can actually differentiate the front screen to fit the individual needs of a deafblind consumer. We do that during training. When we beta tested this software, we recognized that typical words that are used in softwares are also used in operating systems and they were causing some confusion for the consumers or the end users. So sometimes I would say to the consumer, now go to the home screen and it would take them actually back to the iPhone home, home screen. And I meant the home screen in the app. So there was confusion during training. So we decided to change the name of this to front page to lessen the confusion. Also, you can see the term options originally this icon was labeled settings. But when I was working with individuals and training them on how to use the app, when it's in settings, it would take them back or they would use the normal settings on their home screen for their iOS. So we changed it to options. When individuals are using Braille, they have shortcuts of reading Braille. Typically, they'll read the first few letters of that sentence or that word. Then they know where they are. Then they'll click to the next line. Many apps typically have the same first word 
in multiple lines. For example, call details, call from, call information or what have you, they all start with call. So it's difficult for someone using Braille to navigate. It takes much more time to be able to navigate in an app if the same word is used as the starter. So we made sure that every line had a unique start word so that deafblind consumers could navigate through the app more quickly. So these are some of the many specifics that we've been able to establish so that the deafblind consumers can have an easier time of using the app. And also you can have an easier time of training individuals. It might take you only 15 to 20 minutes to train somebody on the use of this app because of how well it's set up and what we've thought about in establishing it. Some people say that it's taking about a max of 20 minutes. Other people say they don't even need that much time. It's very intuitive in its design and easy to learn. In speaking of the app itself, as you can see, there are six icons on the front page. The first I believe is contacts and then Favorite, no, I'm sorry, the first icon is favorites. My apologies. Favorites is obviously where you put the people that you contact most often. So if I call my mother all the time, she would be added to my favorites. The second icon is contacts. That would be your complete address book. The third icon is dialer. So if you don't have that individual or that company in your phone book, if you're gonna dial that business one time, you would just use dialer. Then we have recents. That would be your call history log. What's really interesting about the call history or recents is if you open that up, you'll find all the text from that conversation saved automatically. You can choose to share the text from any conversation to yourself or send a copy to a friend via email or what have you, you have an option for sharing. This is helpful because if I was calling my physician, for example, and the physician gave me instructions on what I needed to do, of course, I can't take notes. My hands are busy on the braille output, so I don't have the opportunity to take notes about what the directions are. This allows me to save the conversation. I can review it at a later time and have the steps already noted for myself. This will only save the text portion of the conversation, not the video portion. So if I am using American Sign Language, that portion of the conversation will not be saved. Anything that is typed to me will be saved, however. After recent, you'll see answering machine. And obviously that means somebody can leave a message. This is different than native RTT. With native RTT, there wasn't an option to leave a message or there isn't an option to do so. If I'm calling 911 in an emergency and I'm disconnected, 
I'm not able to answer my calls. 911 can leave a message and I can read it and move forward with whatever I need to do. So it's a nice option that we have in our app that isn't available in native RTT. And then finally is options. Tor, do you mind opening options? Confirm it to Brian, it's open. Okay, great. As you can see, we're in the options screen. Before I go into the options, I want to let you know that the first time you use MMX, if you use a Braille display, it will automatically recognize your Braille display and ask you a few questions right off the bat to make sure that the app is configured to your Braille display. These questions are rather simple. Which type of Braille do you use? How many cells are in your Braille display? Because there are different sizes of Braille display cells. There are three simple questions. Once you answer those, you're able to use it with your Braille display. If for some reason you miss the setup wizard, you can still go into options and configure the app to work with your Braille display manually. We're trying to make your life just a little bit easier in the options that we have presented in the app. So the first category of options is general. In the general category, it gives you the option for background colors in the app itself, not for the conversation as of yet, but for the app itself. So what that front play page will display as. Some people who are deafblind prefer to have muted backgrounds, others prefer to have more brightly colored backgrounds. If you want, you can also remove some of the icons that show up on the front page and organize them in the way that you need. Some consumers have limited visual function. With too many choices, it might become too complex for them. And it maybe just can be favorites. Then that person can just hit favorites and make the phone calls that they need to make without having to bother with the other icons on the front page. It just depends on the individual and their needs. If we go back to the top, after general, we have Braille. <clears throat> and this allows you to do specific settings to configure with your Braille reader. As I mentioned before, we do have an automatic wizard for configuring to your Braille reader. And these are the same options if you miss that wizard. Then in call, that in call category is where you can, things get really exciting. The first thing you'll notice is a mode, selection of mode. That can be braille mode or visual mode. Let me explain why we have those two different options. One of the largest challenge with iOS is stream text. So when you have streaming text on your iPhone, there's no way that you control it and how quickly it comes in. That's why you may have noticed in the video call,
you saw that the lines looked jagged on the visual display. And that's because I was in braille mode. When you select braille mode, then the exact number of cells available on the braille display is all that will be given at one time. So if you're using a 40 character braille display, then only 40 characters will be shown at a time per line. As a user, I decide then when to go to the next line of 40 characters. So that's how we overcame the streaming text issue with iOS. In a visual mode, it would be a very clean display that is fit to meet the visual needs of the consumer. However, when you're in visual mode, you can't control the speed that the text is coming in. You can slow it down to a rate that meets your needs, or you can have it come in at normal speeds. Some people need it to come in a little bit slower so that they have more time to process it. And the consumer has control. Let me tell you, when you set it up really slow, it's really slow. <laughs> I tested it out one time and I, I typed as quickly as I could, but the text was set on slow mode. I typed maybe 20 lines. I walked away, I came back 10 minutes later and it was still coming up on the screen. So that's a lot of power that consumers have. And that's our philosophy. We want the consumer to decide what works best for them, not what we think is best for them. So once we finish with those options, we'll go into the actual text setup. And that is the text that will display in the call itself. This benefits individuals who rely on visual access. So there are several different options on how that text can be uniquely set for that individual's preference. Font size, color, background, and Tor, if you could show those options. Referring to Brian, I'm showing the options. and uh, making sure that uh, it's uh, my font and the other person's uh, font, my font size and the other person's uh, font size. I can make it largest, for instance, and my font size largest as well. In my example here, I have two different colors, yellow and um, green. So as Brian was saying, to differentiate the, um, in the, the text that I'm writing and the text that I'm receiving. Back to you, Brian. Great. So that's how it works. So just a small tidbit for you, as a consumer myself, I'll set my text as smaller and then the incoming text I'll set to be larger because I already know what I typed. I don't have to read that. So it's easier for me to be able to navigate through the conversation knowing that the incoming text is the larger text. The last category is answering machine. 
of course, you're able then to turn the answering machine on, leave a text greeting. Hi, this is Brian. Sorry, I'm not here. Please leave me a message and I'll call you back at a later time, G-A-S-K. So that's it. That's the functionality of the app. We have an older design for Windows. It will be redesigned soon so that it will have all of the specifications that we've shown you today. There are some very powerful features that are only offered on Windows. Our licensing system permits consumers to have as many devices as they want for communication access. Under one single license. So that means I can have this app on Windows, iPad, and iPhone under one single license. Maybe the iPhone display is too small for me to work with, but with my iPhone, I could rely on that for notifications. So when it vibrates, I know that I could go to my iPad or my Windows and answer the phone there. It's more comfortable to navigate a call on the larger screen displays I could try to do it on my phone as well, but having them all linked gives the individual options for how they want to receive and navigate a call. This hasn't been tested yet, but my understanding is those individuals who have Fitbit watches are able to receive notifications on their watch so they know that they have an incoming call. So I would like to talk a little bit more about the flexibility of this platform. We've been talking about people who are deaf and blind and how this is established for them. That's a little misleading in that this technology is not limited to the use by deaf blind individuals. People who have Deafness and other disabilities can also use this. So if there is a deaf individual who has cerebral palsy and they might have limited use of their hands, they could receptively take in the American Sign Language through this app and then they could type with a special keyboard that they have to be able to communicate on the phone. So that's what I call reverse RTD. Where instead of the interpreter typing to me, the interpreter signs to me and I type back to the interpreter. So as you can see, this has more broad application than just the deafblind community. Tor, do you mind showing the brief video of how this can be used in other ways? And then we can go into that in a little bit more depth after our audience has seen the video. Absolutely, Brian. And uh, we also have uh, a film of a consumer uh, that we can show later if uh, we have the time. It's actually what I, okay, sorry. What I did is I made, instead of a film, a PowerPoint. I'm limited in my abilities. So um, I made a PowerPoint to show the different uh, scenes and different areas where it can be used. So I'm gonna share a screen with the PowerPoint. Just one second, please. So everybody should be able to see more PowerPoint. Am I MXDB 
breaking the barriers. So uh, one of the points that, that uh, is very important uh, with the MMX, as Brian was saying also, is that uh, it's independent living at your hands. So the ability to make phone calls wherever you are, it's something that many of us experience, but it's been very challenging for the deafblind community. But also, as uh, Brian was also explaining, uh, accessing a CF, but also getting assistance wherever you are. And then also finding your way around. So the uh, flexibility of being able to make phone calls is uh, just connecting to Wi-Fi or 4G and then make point-to-point uh, -point calls or via the relay service uh, to hearing people. So I'm showing this uh, picture where Brian is talking to, to his uh, assistant, Stacy, and is actually making that call from uh, a Starbucks. And as Brian was pointing out, uh, it wasn't possible just a short while back. So it's just the ability of just being able to go out and, and make your phone calls wherever you are. Something also that is very important is uh, being able to go to the local shop. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Brian knows where things generally are, but um, to be honest, I myself, they moved everything in the shelves where in the supermarket they usually go. So of course that's a nightmare. And uh, for Brian, he can, uh, for instance, uh, pick up a can and then show to his assistant, is this the one that I'm looking for? Something else also really important is uh, medicine. You know, medicine, you have a medicine when you have to take your medicine at a sp specific time. You just have to know where it is and open the right bottle. So just to make sure that you have the right bottle, flip the camera and then uh, you can show the camera. And as uh, the iPhone is always connected to the uh, uh, Braille display and is showing this picture. So uh, communication using real time text is, is immediate. It's also important because uh, with real time text is, uh, as it's a, a conversation, if uh, uh, Brian in this case has to refocus the camera, turn a little bit to the right, turn to the left, it's much easier to say using in a conversation, not sending a text message. The delay would be incredible. These are the, some examples. This is the last slide, Brian. Of course, with your contact information. I close the screen with the PowerPoint. Back to you, Brian. Great, so that's really one of the cool things about my MMX. It's not just about telecommunications, but it's almost like having your own support service person right there in your pocket. If I don't have somebody there to give me environmental information, I can use the device so that somebody in a remote location can tell me what I'm seeing. One thing that I do wanna caution you we don't support using my MMX for use to guide yourself during travel, not unless you've you've had appropriate training in how to do so. I mean, it's not designed for that purpose, so it won't necessarily help you safely cross the street. So we don't want people to to overestimate what they can do with with the, uh, the software but it is good for connecting to someone remotely who can see what's around you and tell you what, what's there. I've been talking an awful lot. I think maybe we, I, do, I would like to go to a different topic, but prior to doing that, 
there is another video I want you to see. I promise it's the last video. So, so Tor, can you show the video with one of our customers? Yes, Brian. So I will do a screen share. Um, one second. So I have it here. I will just play. And can you increase the volume, please? I've had a number of discussions around how deafblind people could access the video phone. In the past, of course, being older, I used the TTY. As my vision deteriorated, the lettering on the T. TTY wasn't accessible. The video phone was at that point, and it was wonderful, but my vision again declined, and it was no longer a resource for me. And I thought about how the resources for deafblind people had now dwindled to IT relay only. So, I mean, it was very slow and methodical, and it was very fatiguing to look at a system where I either typed on a computer unit or on a cell phone. Or could you click on the captioning as well? Thank you. 
the token for them. We have access to a keyboard, which gets hooked up to their video phone system. And then they are ready to make this accommodated phone call for just live video conversations. Again, it can be really seamless and they're so helpful to me. So I also had the opportunity to call the guest travel agent because I was interested in the guest travel agent in the past. Um, we had done a bit of planning back in court, but I asked if those utilized forms and video training so we were able to go ahead with this guest line talk here, and I could feel like there was an equal participant in this conversation, and I could do a live conversation and not rely on the uh, delays in cameras and using an email system. So this offers many Sorry. Back to you, Brian. Okay. I know we had some technical difficulties. It looks like there was some lag in the streaming. But we wanted you to know that at least we do have some happy customers out there. <laughs> I'd like to turn to some of your questions now. Some of you, somebody wanted to know more about how to get this software. There is a process involved with that. And I would suggest that you contact me directly and I can walk you through the steps that are necessary to make that happen. There are a few particular things that you have to know and, and do in order to, to get the software. So something that is very important to mention here The question is, it's great to have software that provides access to people who are deaf blind, but can it also do more? We have a unique situation here in the US. Our relay system is decentralized and it's broken up by modality. There isn't any way to seamlessly have them be interoperable. Our software though is used in many countries around the world. This is not a US only version that I've shown you. This is the international version of the software. And then other countries it's used a lot more. All consumers use MyMMX, regardless of whether you're a signer or not. Here, there are some restrictions imposed on us at the federal level. You are the ones who would have the power to change that. Within your states, you can provide consumers with direct access through 711, and to 911, et cetera, through your state relay services, or even allow them to make direct calls to someone who uses a TTY, RTT, and in certain mode is compatible with TTYs. It's one of the reasons why we're here today. 
it asks you to partner with us to develop the sort of access that would help us work with your state's wireline services. The software is already compatible with that technology. We just need the rules to change so that we can provide this access to everyone. The power is in your hands. If you're interested in making your state a leader in this process, please join us, partner with us, get in touch with us, and we are ready, willing, and able to talk to you about how to make this happen in your state. I believe someone has a question. Was it Tor? Yes, Brian, not me, but I think many in the audience have a lot of questions. And maybe we yes. should turn to uh, Holly and uh, um, Travis to get the question. Okay. So yeah, let's um, let's turn to our Q and A period now. And Tor, feel free to jump in to answer any of the questions that you'd like. Holly here. I'd like to thank you both for your presentation. So that's a lot of really great information. We do have quite a number of questions that people have posted in the chat throughout the talk. Travis will sign the questions that are currently in the chat. And we may not have time to answer all of the questions that are currently posted in chat. Perhaps uh, Brian and Tor, you wouldn't mind sharing your email addresses with the audience so that if they don't get their questions answered today, they can ask them of you directly. Would that be okay? Brian says yes. Okay, great. So let's turn it over to Travis now. Hi, everyone. This is Travis. I'm not going to say Travis speaking, but actually I'm signing. So I'm going to go through the questions in chat. I'm going to go them in the order in which they were posted. And if, if necessary, I can call on you to give your question and sign. Some it looks like have already been answered just a little while after the question was posted. So I won't go through those if I can see that they've already been answered. I'll focus on those that perhaps haven't gotten a clear answer yet. This one is, let me see which was, what's the first one here? That's from Sabina Toll. asking if MMX can interface with Zoom. Can you participate with, in Zoom meetings through my MMX? Brian speaking, at this time, I don't believe that's possible, no. But maybe Tor knows more about that or if there are any plans to make that work. Confirming that is not possible, but uh, I've, it's the same way that a VRS uh, software works. And I've been in uh, conference calls when a uh, deaf person using VRS, the interpreter called the uh, telephone line on the VRS. And then uh, the uh, individual had the uh, VRS app uh, in front of uh, him and then the Zoom conversation. So it's not optimal. He was displayed on Zoom, but the interpreter was on uh, a voice and uh, it was a good discussion on Zoom, on the Zoom conference, but the same way that people are using VRS software. Brian here. I'd just like to add a comment. It would be nice to make that happen. But we also have to think about the limitations of the refreshable braille display. You have one line at a time. If you're in a conference call with a lot of people, I'll never know who's talking. It'll just be a constant, a constant barrage of braille coming at me. So that would be another consideration. Travis signing, thank you for your answer. I mean, I think that's, that makes total sense. The next one is sort of two questions 
combined, also from Savannah. Actually, the first one's from Savannah, the second one is from Steve Peck, but I'm gonna put them together because they're related. One asks, who's responsible for providing training as you roll MMX out in different places? Brian speaking. For those states who receive equipment through their state NDBEDP, or that's also the ICC program, we can provide training. I also do provide remote training as well. And we also do train the trainer type trainings. We can uh, do remote training for, I have done remote training for a lot of customers around the country. If the challenge is just scheduling. I know a lot of state TED programs don't provide training. Hopefully that's gonna be changing because it's, it's a good question. Uh, deaf blind people do need a lot of training. You can't just drop the equipment in their laps and expect them to get going with it. Travis speaking, well, there's a related question. RTT, as you say, is native in a lot of phones, but I imagine it'll be it'll be changed as as time goes by. Will your product also change to keep up with the changes in native RTT? Brian speaking. We will try to keep our software as stable as possible. We don't want to introduce a lot of changes. Uh, if things for sighted people change all the time. Apps get updated or, or completely revamped every six months or every year. We prefer to have a high degree of stability and make tweaks as needed, but we don't want to overhaul the, the design. We wanted to make it as intuitive as possible for the for most of our beta testers were able to pick it up pretty quickly. I don't really believe that there's going to be a lot for people to learn in order to start using my MMX because we have this, it has been designed so intuitively. Travis speaking, thank you for that response. The next question I'm going to ask the, the person, Alexis Kennedy to turn their camera on and ask the question themselves. Hi, this is Alexis. My name is Alexis Kennedy. I work for the state of Georgia, running both the TED program and the ICC. I'm not sure through which program we might be able to distribute this, but we are hungry for this type of equipment and this type of service. One concern that we have is that when the equipment and the training have been provided, I didn't see tech support as one of your six icons. On Sorensen's equipment, there's a, a quick button you can press to get tech support. And maybe I'm getting ahead of things now, but I'd be concerned that people would be reaching out to us a lot and that a lot of our resources would go towards providing that kind of support. Are you planning to ha have an option for customers to reach out to you for support rather than reaching out to us all the time? Brian speaking. Hi, Alexis. I hope you're doing well there in Georgia. It's good to be in touch with you again. We have 24 seven tech support. I get connect con people contacting me in the middle of the night. Um, even though it means I have sometimes less time to spend with my family, I respond as best I can. But yeah, the tech support question isn't really related so much to MMX, but it usually has to do with how to make MMX work best on different platforms. So to answer your question, we know that uh, trainers aren't always knowledgeable about adaptive technologies that are out there. You know, I have 12 different Braille displays in my office, and I try to keep up to date with all of them uh, and answer questions people have with that. So yeah, we, we don't at this point have the ability to provide that service 
in the, on an um, immediate basis. This is Travis, next question. This is coming from David Weiss. David, did you wanna come up on the screen or do you want me just to relay your question? I'll give you an opportunity to ask it yourself if you would like. No? Okay, so I'll go ahead and restate okay. the question. So David has a question. As part of the National Deafblind Equipment Distribution Program, will that program offer subsidies or monthly payments or subsidies for broadband services for individuals who are deaf, blind and low income? Ryan here, the ICC program does face several challenges. It's, it's um, not only, it is available only to those with limited income. Those who earn over 45,000 a year would not qualify for the program. And that is why we are hoping to partner with your state TED program so that we can provide this service to all people who are deafblind, not just those who are on limited incomes. Another challenge that the ICC faces, and I don't mean to criticize ICC, but the many of the people who run the state ICC programs seem not to understand what relay even means. Even though they work with deafblind clients and they're running this program, many of them are themselves hearing or hearing people who are blind and they don't understand the concept of VRS or relay in general because they don't use it. So often I have to educate them and more than, more than just once about the issues surrounding relay. So I know, I know you and your state relay and TED programs, you already know what this means, but we need to find a way to make it easier for consumers to get in touch with you all because you are the ones who know what they're talking about. If they say I need to contact VRS, you know what VRS is, but many of the people running the ICC programs for states don't even know what, what that refers to. And again, I'm not saying this to disparage these programs, but there are people who have different levels of experience and that can impact the consumer's ability to get support. Thank you, Brian. There are three questions. And they are asking if you can come to present to their office or agency. So Tor already put your contact information in the chat. And Nazar can also send a follow-up email with contact information. I'm sure both of you are motivated to provide additional trainings or presentations to agency and offices. Correct, Brian? Brian speaking. I can't wait to visit your states. I want to get there so badly everywhere. And I missed the NASRA conference. I miss being out and about. I haven't been on a plane for over a year. And I thought we were finally free of everything, but now COVID is resurging. So I don't know when I'll be able to get everywhere, but I can't wait. First chance I get, I'm going to be on a plane to visit any of you. So yeah. Very, very heartfelt sentiments, Brian. So I'm not seeing any more questions left. We have about five minutes of our time before we close. If anyone has any last minute questions they would like to pose. Uh, Brian here. I would like to share some closing comments actually before we do anything else. I know that people have a lot of questions. What I hope is that that'll motivate you to reach out to us so that we can provide you more information. And we'll have more time then to discuss individually what it is you're interested in. So please do that. I do want to emphasize with all of you that I know that your TED programs are designed differently from the ICC program. I know some of the states 
have the restriction on the means-based testing to provide services. I'd like to, though, for you to consider these rules and speaking with my advocate hat on now. If you have means testing for everyone in your state, you have to remember that income level is not, does not really apply the same in the experiences of deafblind people. Deafblind people have to earn more in order to afford the equipment that they need, though it'll just register as more income, even though that it goes out as quickly as it comes in. So I'd like to consider you ask you to consider a carve out for deafblind people and anything that is means tested in your state to better serve the community. Also for deaf people with other disabilities, please review your rules and see if you can provide any carve outs for them as need as as a need arises having means testing for all groups of, with all disabilities is not functionally equivalent which i believe is something that you are required to provide functional equivalence deafblind people want to work with the state ted programs but there are a number of limitations that serve as barriers in their way. And we need to be able to provide them with the options that will best serve them. And the most important comment I wanna leave you with is thank you. Thanks to all of you. Thank you to NASRA for giving us this platform today to share with you. And I do miss you all. I wish we had the NASRA conference this year, but. I'm definitely going to be there next year because it's going to be party time. <laughs> For sure. This is Travis speaking. There are some comments in the chat. One from Sherry Collins that says, thank you, Tor and Brian. Excellent presentation. We have a lot of work to do. I'm sure we'll be in touch. Another from Savannah Tool. Great presentation. Very beneficial. And then from Steve Peck, who said, I agree, let's get the ball moving for the deafblind community. So now this is Travis speaking for myself. My best friend is deafblind. I have a heart for the deafblind community and I'm in it. I'm looking forward to providing more functionally equivalent resources for deafblind individuals. Also, we have someone from Iowa Kelly Sieber. Thank you. This is very helpful. Okay, Holly, you want to wrap it up? Sure. Thank you both so much for a great presentation. What really struck me about your equipment is that it's made by the people who use it. You don't often see that. You don't see products being made by the people who use them, but it really shows in your design that it's made by deafblind people and with deafblind people in mind. I think that's key. We need to support businesses and organizations that don't, don't just serve our constituents with disabilities, but actually involve people, people with disabilities. I very much appreciate that. I appre appreciate both NYS and Access 256 for that approach to providing functional equivalence to telecommunication services. Thank you both so much. We'll make sure to share your contact information with both NASRA and TEDPA members so that they can reach out to you and learn more about how they can implement this type of service in their state programs. Thank you again so much. We appreciate it. Brian says, thanks.